Something had struck me as odd about our planet. When you look at every other species on our planet, they all control their weight automatically. The only exception was us and any animal unfortunate enough to be fed by us. I just couldn't understand why we were the exception. Why did we require willpower and everything else did it on autopilot? So I applied the only relevant skill I had, which was looking at evidence. And I found there was very little evidence for the standard eating advice we are normally given. And there was a whole stream of evidence which had been largely ignored. In fact, what we have been told about nutrition is dangerously wrong. No matter what I'm rakal, not a guy you know. Heart disease. Totox, a heart disease, yeah. Tin tin. Liver disease. Liver disease. Asthma. Asthma. Yeah. Diabetes. Diabetes. No, I'm not with diabetes, man. Probably half the people here have diabetes. Yeah. Diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, kidney disease, all what we call chronic diseases. When did those diseases start? 70s. 80s. So before that, people were dying from nakun... Hepatitis. Hepatitis. Pneumonia. Pneumonia. TB. TB. Are they all the Mokurumala? Mokurumala. These are the ones that came with the Europeans. Bacteria, infectious diseases. If we go back further, Balanoi, Nakil Nai, Balandabuna. What's the main one? I had this label that I'm a fat girl. I am overweight. I have asthma. I've always had asthma. I have a rescue inhaler, and then I have a maintenance inhaler. My rescue inhaler is becoming like a regular inhaler where I use it two or three times a day. And I've just gotten used to it now. And I've been in the hospital a couple times for asthma where it got really bad. When people talk about wellness and health and are you well, how do you feel? My automatic pilot is always, I'm great. My vision is getting worse and worse very rapidly. I had three fibroids and one was really big. Upper respiratory infection. They put me on a broad spectrum antibiotics. Mega doses of prednisone. Azithromycin. And so I had this standing prescription. I'll just take it myself. I was also diagnosed with ADD. I don't know if that came up anywhere this on there. This is really important. So when yeah. ADD? I'm like, oh, and incidentally. Oh, and by the way. I remember when I was little, my mom taught me to write a letter. Dear Kathy, how are you? I am fine. Like those were the three things I learned first. How are you? I am fine. And I'm still doing that, but I'm not fine. <laughs> this is levothyroxine. I take one a day for my thyroid. This is atorvastatin. It's for my high cholesterol. This is phenofibric, tizanidine, doloxetine. I take that for anxiety. Hydrocodone, cyclobenzaprine, gabapentin tablets that's supposed to make your brain process pain in a different way. This is also for my thyroid. This is for my neck pain. These are muscle relaxers. And that's my medication, which I think is more than enough. 
My mom struggled with weight her whole life. She created me to be an emotional eater. Somebody was picking on me at school. Come on, let's go get an ice cream. Something happened good in school. Oh, let's go out and celebrate. We'll go to Mickey D's, you know. And I ended up doing the same thing with my kids and my grandkids. My mom finally developed the Alzheimer's and the dementia. And I saw the progression of the disease from start to finish. And, you know, I, I forget things now and I can't think of words and I start thinking, oh my God. You know, I'm, I'm the same way. I've gotten to be the same way, you know. This is a vicious cycle that needs to be stopped. Kim, my daughter, she has arthritis. She has lymphedema. She has hypothyroid. Her daughter, Kaylee, is nine. She has celiac disease. Barry's children are five and four. Barry and Lauren, my son and daughter-in-law, uh, they have a daughter, Abigail, who's five. Abigail, you want to come back with me? Okay, sweetheart. Just step right up here. She has autism. She's nonverbal. She has epilepsy. She has central sleep apnea. <laughs> Nope, nope. She has digestive problems. Any trouble urinating, any trouble with bowel movements. She has constipation. Constipation? Okay. She's yeah. on the Miralax daily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The hardest part, I just having a child that can't speak. I know my wife feels the same way. That's that's to me, that's like the most painful part. Abigail. Abs. Look. Abs, look over here. Abigail. Abigail seems like she's doing really well. And then she'll get tired and she'll have a whole bunch of seizures. And it's like right, she's forgotten everything. It's like her brain resets itself. Playing uh, music? Yeah. It's really the seizures that compounds her autism. We're counting on average about 50 a day. So she's getting a great big cocktail of garbage. This stuff's pretty mild compared to this stuff. This is called Onfi. This stuff here is, it's over $1,000 a bottle. My insurance covers 70%, so um, I get the joy of only paying over $300 a month just for this stuff. Have you noticed any improvement with it? We have, otherwise, believe me, <laughs> for over $300 a month, she would have been off of it a long time ago. The whole situation makes me mad, but mostly just because how many six-year-old kids are these neurologists putting on these heavy narcotics? I mean, this is as bad as if you were to go buy heroin off of the street. And that's the first thing that these doctors are trained to offer the kids. That's it. Good job. I hate it. The lump in my throat as I was reading. The side effects, man, I mean, may cause harm to yourself or others, may have rashy, irritated skin, may cause sleeplessness. And I, I, like, I've seen my daughter have some of these side effects. We're, we're gonna need a lot of help for sure. I just, I have no idea. I have no idea how we're gonna do it. Do what? Switch her diet. She refused just about everything except for like uh, the goldfish and Doritos, so. I just don't know. I don't know what it's gonna be like. I may get overwhelmed with it. But I'm truly at a point in my life where I'm afraid. I'm afraid that my chips have run out. You breathe it in and then you hold it and then you breathe out. That's how that works. I'm scared. I'm genuinely scared. Debbie, you're about to change your diet. What are you most afraid of? Failure.
We are all physiologically and genetically hunter-gatherers. We've only been consuming an agriculturally based diet now for maybe 500 generations or so versus more than 100,000 generations, not, not 100,000 years, but 100,000 generations on a largely meat and fat based diet. We have the brains that we do because of the enormous amount of fat that we consume as a species throughout our evolutionary history. Suddenly now we're eating a carbohydrate based diet and in the last 13 or so generations since this thing called the Industrial Revolution, this has just gone down a slippery slope. You are the oldest culture on earth, is the Yuma culture. 40,000 years. So anybody that has a go at us, don't talk to us unless you've got 40,000 years of research. Yeah? The American scientific expedition that came to Arnhem Land in 1948 showed that Yuma people were extremely robust. No chronic disease, great teeth, well-built, muscular. I remember Jung were in the 70s, ripple muscles, they were like supermen. I came back in 83 to see a population that was decimated. This chronic disease tsunami that is now wiping across the Jung population. Funerals are just this constant part of life here. Well, you finish one and then the next one arrives and then the next one arrives and you can kind of get a funeral fatigue. 6.3 mark up. And all of life is needing to be reorganised around that. There are definitely still people alive today who, as they were growing up, were living a traditional lifestyle. We're running out of those people. Everybody died. My friends have all gone. Even my best friends, they're not with me anymore. Life's not supposed to be like No, this. no. Dear Angel, can you tell me in your own words why why are you here at this retreat? Why oh, I can't talk when I'm walking. Okay, fair enough. Maybe down at the beach when I'm sitting down, I will. I think my body maybe weren't built to do some walks or, I don't know. I remember when I was a little girl, I used to come with my grandfather. We'd be walking along this beach. And every night he'd, he'd share stories. He would tell me, this is the way to go. This is what you eat. Don't eat this. This is nice, but this is bad. Don't touch this. Don't eat this. It's not even food. It's nanginning. Nanginning meaning non-edible. Even those red and black beads, they're pretty to make a good necklace, but it's not good to eat. It's nanginning. <laughs> So much has been done to Yolngu people to send the message that they are inferior and that whatever is going on in the dominant culture is more powerful and superior and that definitely applies to people's perception of food. This one's got caffeine. Coca-Cola is something that's frequently drunk for breakfast. It's something frequently given to really small children for breakfast. A lot of people look in on that and they think, wow, that family mustn't care about that child. But that's coming from information that these families just don't have. The total carbs in one serving 28.6 grams and a serve is 40 grams. They believe they're being loving and caring to their child by giving them good food bought from the dominant culture store. No sugar in this one. The Australian government's pumping millions of dollars in to try to fix the Aboriginal health. And here's these two individuals that have managed to do what they're trying to do on a large scale. What they're managing to do is to say the way that you had it before white person came was actually the right way. We have ancient wisdom and we have modern wisdom. And I think the two need to work harmoniously together, in balance. Hello. 
So in the philosophy of Hope for Health, what is good food? Good food is food that is grounded in the tradition of the Aboriginal people. This is the Yolngu way of cooking. And how might that translate to the rest of us? Um, it's basically meat and vegetables, okay? Meat and vegetables that come from a place that is closest to its natural state. Years ago, there was a commercial for a particular margarine. That's not margarine, that's my sweet creamy butter. This woman, who actually turned out to be Mother Nature, tasted it and she said, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature, it made lightning happen and thunder. The fact is that processed food is not natural. That's trying to fool Mother Nature. Should I get the trash bag out? Probably. <laughs> we should be eating the foods that nature provides, not that are scientized, not that factories provide. Would it be okay if I sat down on that chair over here? Go through the store yeah. without a problem. Okay, I'm sorry. Your mom is the daughter of my father's sister. So your dad is my mom's uncle. That's right. Dude, everything in there is going to have to go. I think it's probably best if it does. Pastaroni. What, what is pastaroni? Pasta. I guess. <gasps> Even the name in and of itself tells you how highly processed it is. It's somebody's brand name. Abigail, get down. Any food preferences? I know you gave me the three-day diet diary. Um, those are her food yeah. preferences. <laughs> uh, SpaghettiOs, chicken nuggets, goldfish. Goldfish is a normal. Doritos. What about drinks? Apple juice. Apple juice. We've hijacked our taste buds with food-like substances that are not whole food, that are not real food. Here's a good one. Imitation vanilla flavor. Propylene glycol, sodium benzoate, phosphoric acid. Doesn't that sound I lovely? I don't even know what it <laughs> is. Right. The whole low-fat thing is completely wrong. So we're gonna add more fat to the diet. I mean, good natural fats, that's avocados, olive oil, meat fats from pastured animals like beef tallow, duck fat, lard. Having the federal government get behind the low-fat diet changed vastly the food system. You know, companies flooded in with all their low-fat products responding to this huge demand. One of the most insidious things that market does for us Light. <laughs> light. <laughs> Misspelled light is even worse than spelled correctly light. Every single day now we have newfangled foods and food-like substances being introduced. And then on top of it, we're genetically modifying and adding chemicals and things that we have no way of, of adapting to. There's added sugar in everything. Ketchup, sugar, juice for the grandkids. Sugar, 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 corn syrup. The applesauce is corn syrup? High fructose corn syrup is the second ingredient. I would have never guessed. Fructose? It's not going to be anything in here. We have found a winner. You know what? Scratch that. There's sugar again. That's something. Yeah. Wow. Obviously, we will never again eat cereal in our lives. <laughs> Perfect. Get rid of it. Bread and other grain-related products are really worrisome, A, because of their gluten issue, but most importantly, because of their carbohydrate content. I don't even know if we need, need to say anything about uh, this. Yeah. Just, you know. <laughs> okay. I call wheat the perfect obesogen, food perfectly crafted to make you fat. Wheat is in all frozen dinners, all breakfast cereals, taco seasoning, seasoning mixes, instant soup mixes, canned soup, salad dressings. In other words, of the 60,000 products in the average supermarket today, 59,000 have wheat. There is nothing you can get at a grain that you can't get anywhere else. Not even close, in fact. Meat, seafood, vegetables, fruit, nuts and seeds, and eggs have so much more to give. Maple and brown sugar, heart healthy. You know that that can't be right, right? <laughs> wheat was added 10,000 years ago, which sounds like a long time because it predates the Egyptian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, but 10,000 years represents less than one half of 1% of human race's time on Earth. We went from a diet that was 90% you know, meat and fat to suddenly relying on grains and legumes for the very first time in our evolutionary history. These all gotta go. You know, when a label goes out of its way to tell you how healthy it is, like 100% whole grain, reduced fat. By taking fat out, you guarantee that people have to shift over to high carbohydrate foods. That's just what happens. Fat is a critically important part of our diet but we've gotta be super selective because some fats are very threatening to our health. The reason olive oil is so good is because you can get the oil out of the olive really easily. It's like cold pressed extra virgin olive oil. But you take something like this, 
This poison. In order to make packaged food, you need a fat that's solid and stable. So everything on a supermarket shelf, cookies, crackers, chips, need a hard fat, a solid fat. That's what gives it shelf life. If you get rid of butter, suet, tallow, lard, traditional fats, as our guidelines told us to do, what's left? Hardened vegetable oils, which is basically trans fats. We don't want to use any of the vegetable oils like corn oil or safflower oil, soybean oil. Vegetable oils are toxic. They're industrial oils. They are foods that we could not have manufactured until the industrial era. There are seeds that have oil in them, but that don't release their oil readily, so you have to use high heat and solvents to do so. That totally wrecks the molecules, destroys many of the antioxidants. It's a mangled, disgusting, smelly mess. Every cell in your body is wrapped in a membrane that's made out of about half fat and half protein. If the fatty acids comprising your cell membrane are unnatural, that cell membrane cannot function in the way that it's supposed to function. And that's the beginning of disease. It starts at the cellular level. Vegetable oils are acting like little miniature Trojan horses. Your body doesn't recognize them as not natural. It will make cell membranes. It'll make brain cells. But it's as if you were trying to build a house and your contractor said, um, well, we don't have any bricks, but we do have these little styrofoam balls. Let's go for it. Did the food grow on the planet? Did it swim in the water? Did it run on land? That's food. The one question I wish every single doctor on this planet would ask every single one of their patients is, what are you eating? a really nice selection of leafy green vegetables. We've got some excellent proteins, wild salmon, uh, bison, fresh ginger root. We have some nice fat choices. We're gonna be cooking with some coconut oil and okay. lard. What we're doing is focusing on things that are natural. In the Western world, we're not suffering diseases of underconsumption. In fact, it's the opposite. We're suffering diseases of overconsumption. And once we get rid of refined oils, processed foods, refined grains, what we're left with is vegetables, fruit, nuts and seeds, meat, seafood, and good healthy fats. And that is what we should be focusing on. Okay, here's the turmeric. Yep. So we're gonna use some coconut oil to the pan. Yeah, Barry, you know the pan spray I had? Mm -hmm. I had to throw it out. Well, there's no question that the brain can burn glucose. What powers the brain far more efficiently in terms of its energy producing components called the mitochondria is fat. So we're going to get lard all over our hands? Yes. Okay. <laughs> our brains thrive in a fat burning environment. Now, technically, we call this a state of ketosis. And to get into a state of ketosis, one assumes what is called a ketogenic diet, which basically means a diet that's lower in carbs and higher in fat. Oh, that smells amazing with that garlic. Barry, have you ever cooked anything like this in your life? No. <laughs> Being in a mild state of ketosis is really the place to be.
Okay, this is my first video diary. I started this new way of eating today. I figured since we're talking about all natural, I'm going to torment people by having on no makeup. Okay, I know this is not supposed to be a big old cooking show, but here we have some lamb with the bone in and I am sauteing them in some coconut oil and the green you see is kale that I just removed. And I made some riced cauliflower so that I can feel like I'm having carbs. Bone broth in all of these, by the way. Normally, I would just go out and eat three times a day. I'm so used to grabbing and going, but I am really gonna do this. I am gonna do this. I have to do this. <laughs> Emma's convinced that we were punishing her. Are you some chicken? No. No, why not? She's like, why are you taking all of my food away? This is mean. I can't eat macaroni and cheese. I can't eat chicken nuggets. I can't eat SpaghettiOs. She just went down the list. Tattering through this list of, of junk. I'm just like, man, we didn't feed her anything healthy. Like, we literally took away everything that our children have been eating. Okay, okay, don't throw it. Those are scrambled eggs on the floor. She just started pushing my hand away as I was sticking the fork into her mouth. And then she literally crawled across the counter and she grabbed this bag of goldfish that was sitting there and she ripped it open and just starts shoveling handfuls of goldfish into her mouth. It reminded me of when I was a drug addict and I would get my bag and I'd be fiending. For, 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 for something, I'd be fiending for a fix. Oh, for goodness sake. The first five days, she starved herself. She barely ate anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm burnt out, man, I'm burnt out. That was the turning point. She was just more, 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 more. I mean, she just was a bottomless pet. Abigail's eating coconut. And from that day forward, it was like she was eating everything I gave her. Everything. There you go. Barry texted me the day that she was eating with a fork. There you go. Good job. He texted me that she had never done that before, that she was eating a piece of steak with a fork. And what is she eating? Steak and kale. And I mean, I was, I was literally jumping up and down. And I think he was too. I was so happy. She just took the fork and stuck the stuck the steak and popped it in her mouth like she's been doing it her whole life. It was crazy. Um, so anyways, we're, we're doing great. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where she's at in another two weeks. There you go. Good job. When a little baby's put in your arms and you giggle and they giggle back, this little body is talking to me without language, but talking in their own way. And the baby lights up. He never lit up. We knew from the moment he was put in our arms at two weeks old, we knew something was amiss. When he was three, I decided to put him on a specific carbohydrate diet. Just meat, vegetable, fruit, nuts and seeds, third day on specific carbohydrate diet, he fed himself for the first time. The fifth day, he said his first word. So um, I almost fell over on my chair. He said, we come for welcome. Because I said, thank you. I would always talk to him. And it was always me doing the talking, us doing the talking. And he, you know, wouldn't answer to his name, all that typical autism stuff. I said, thank you, and he said, we come. One of the things, though, that always bothered me was that he didn't seem to be able to stop bobbing, rocking, verbal noises. And so I was already beginning to wonder about if he needed something more. We're at the Shriners Hospitals for Children in Honolulu. We take care of children with brain-based disorders. 
Uh, specifically, we specialize in autism, ADHD, and other developmental problems. Use this hand and tap your fingers. Our medical study involves a clinical trial. We're investigating not only if the ketogenic diet impacts children with autism, but also how it might impact children with autism to help with their language, help with their socialization. We want children to be able to interact meaningfully with their families again. You put that one in there. And you can push it off with, them. yeah. The ketogenic diet and the state of ketosis changes the metabolism in the body. And so instead of using glucose as your primary go-to fuel, the body taps into ketones. Do you want butter too or you're fine? I'm okay. Yeah. Ketones are acids that the body produces from fat. It cannot be produced from carbohydrates or sugars. He likes coconut oil all over everything. And the body uses the ketones for energy for the brain and the free fatty acids for the muscles. Good balance. Open your eyes. Aaron Thatcher has been on the ketogenic diet for approximately six months. He has seen an improvement in some of the core features of his autism, including uh, increased socialization, interaction with his mom. Just to get him peaceful. Yep. It is huge. Brings peace to the whole family. And I would say, you know, our loving interactions are more. Increase independence and self-care skills. Decrease in his stereotypic repetitive movements and behaviors. Aaron, we're going to put these puzzle together, okay? Start with these and I have some here and let me know when you need more. As evidenced by his scores on the ADOS, he initially pre-diet had an ADOS score of 16, which is in the high range for autism. And on his three month follow-up had a score of eight. What do you like doing that makes you feel happy and cheerful? Coming here. Coming here? You like coming here? Okay, what are some other things that make you feel happy? Taking a bus. Taking a bus, that sounds fun. Okay, how about things that you're afraid of? Are there things Turtles. that- Turtles. Turtles like in the story that we read? The ocean. Oh, the honu in the ocean, that makes you feel afraid? I was watching Aaron take the ADOS, and there are questions on the test, like, what do you find scary? And he said- Turtles. Great, A plus, right? So I, I said, can you say that in a complete sentence? Given the opportunity, he probably could. He did. He did. We, did we did give him the opportunity. <laughs> can you tell me in a full sentence? I'm afraid of turtles. Awesome. Tell me in a full sentence. What makes you feel happy? I feel happy. I took the bus. Awesome. That's right. more therapeutic than the question that we asked him. Do you ever feel sad? Mm. Can you describe what it's like when you feel sad? Sometimes I feel lonely. What makes you feel lonely? When I be by myself. Oh, can you say that in a full, full sentence? Full sentence. I feel... I feel upset because I'm a lonely person yeah. by myself. There are some common metabolic processes in the body that exist within every cell in our body. If you take in a medicine, you're targeting a specific mechanism within the body. Whereas if you approach it more broadly, such as through food, we might be able to influence a variety of organ systems, including the brain, the pancreas, the liver, muscle cells, blood vessels, etc., through one intervention. And this is not a new thought. This is an old thought, thousands of years old. I think that eating alone only bolsters the little hamsters in your head that are telling you what you should and shouldn't do. I mean, I, I rarely will sit and eat a meal alone without there being some little commentary going on in the back. Well, you really should have less of this, or you really should have done this or that. There we go, look at that beautiful bird. Oh, that looks so good. But when you eat with other people, you end up talking and bonding and sharing. I like that, I just like that better. So you'll see there's meat and there's fat in there. You don't have to eat it, but it's really good. It's interesting with the fat that's floating. I've become so ingrained over the years of, fat's no good, fat's no good. Don't want fat in my diet. 
You know what I mean? It's hard yeah, to like. I thought about your face, and I'm like, Lisa's gonna be like, I cannot eat that. I thought about you. Oh, it all started with Susan Powder back but, in the early yes, 90s. Yes, with the spiky hair. Yeah, no, no, no. I'd go buy a fat-free cake and I'd eat the whole thing, and I'd be like, I'm eating fat-free. <laughs> but all of that sugar turns into <laughs> fat. It's carbs, so they say it's fat-free. When really, well, yeah, when you're eating it at the time, it's fat free. It has yeah, no fat in it. Yeah, but what does it turn it. into once it goes into your system? Fat. More fat. So we're gonna make the mayonnaise. Basically, eggs and lemon plus oil equals mayonnaise. Okay. Right? I love it. So let's prove it. This is olive oil. Yeah, I'm using olive oil. You wanna use a pure oil like this that isn't gonna be Look toxic to your body. And Lisa's scared oil. of the oil. It's right. gonna be okay, Lisa. I'm like counting up the weight watchers points in my head. I would love to be able to not have to count weight watchers points and not have to um, be so scared of eating sometimes, you know? But I'm scared of, if I don't do that, then I'm gaining the weight back. And so it's, it's, that, it's that allowing yourself to have the freedom to trust your body, to trust that when you do it, it'll be okay because you're eating real food. Doing this as, as an act of love, as something we're all doing. To a long <laughs> life of happiness and health. And friendship. And friendship, absolutely. You, Cheers. That was Cheers. fun. I love you, girls. Mm -hmm. I love you, too. too. In the 1950s, the nation was really in a panic about the rising tide of heart disease that had come from pretty much out of nowhere to be the nation's leading cause of death. In 1955, President Eisenhower himself has a heart attack, and he's out of the Oval Office for 10 days. So the nation is fixated on this problem, an urgent public health problem. And nobody really knows what causes heart disease, right? There's a number of different explanations. Maybe it's lack of vitamins, maybe it's car exhaust. So into this vacuum steps Ansel Keys, a pathologist from the University of Minnesota, and he says, it's saturated fats. Saturated fats and cholesterol cause heart disease. Of 10 men, we can expect five to get it. And that was his hypothesis. He had an unshakable faith in his own beliefs. He was called a bully even by his friends. And he was able to get his beliefs inserted into the American Heart Association. So the first ever dietary recommendations telling people to cut back on saturated fat and dietary cholesterol to avoid heart disease were issued by the American Heart Association in 1961. That's the beginning of the story. It's the tiny little acorn that grew into the giant oak tree of advice that we have today and that we can't back out of. What was the evidence for that recommendation by the American Heart Association? It amounted to one study, coincidentally, performed by Ansel Keys. That's the seven country study, where he went to seven countries around the world, mainly in Europe, but also the US and Japan. And he sampled nearly 13,000 men, and he looked at their diet, he looked at their cholesterol, and then he waited to see who had a heart attack or who died of heart disease. I mean, he had a hypothesis that saturated fat caused heart disease, and he was out to prove it. For one, it's very clear that he cherry-picked his countries. He had done a number of pilot studies. He knew where people were not eating much saturated fat and had low rates of heart disease, like Yugoslavia and Italy. And he ignored other countries, also low rates of heart disease, like Germany and Switzerland and France, where they ate a lot of saturated fats. He didn't go to those countries, which would have disproven his hypothesis. His study showed that low saturated fat intake was associated with low rates of heart disease associated, but it doesn't mean that reducing saturated fat is what caused those people to suffer less heart disease. It was also true that these people ate very little sugar. In fact, they also found in that study that what correlated best with cardiovascular death was sugar. Then what ensued was a tremendous amount of science to try to prove Ansel Keys's hypothesis right. Billions of dollars were spent in large clinical trials, the most rigorous kind of science you can do. And they were done in mental hospitals and veterans hospitals, the kind of experiment that you can't do anymore because it's considered unethical. And at the end of billions of dollars of research, they could not prove Ansel Keys's hypothesis.
We have lived a lie for 50 years. Professor Timothy Noakes is one of the very few scientists in the world who have an A1 rating. Sports scientist Timothy Noakes begins his defense against unprofessional conduct. The charges against Noakes were laid by the Association of Dietetics in South Africa after he advised the mother on Twitter to wean her child onto a low-carb, high-fat diet. The health dietitian tweeted, don't listen to him, it's a terrible thing to say, I'm going to report you. This was seriously harm our profession. The dietitian went on and lodged a complaint with the Health Professions Council of South Africa, that's, that's the regulatory body for unprofessional conduct. That is the most serious charge you can level against a medical doctor. It's time for us to take charge of our nation's health. This is the modern day trial of Galileo. Good morning, it's the 16th of February 2016. We continue with the professional conduct hearing against Dr. T. Noakes. And Professor, you are still under oath. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. This is a unique event in the history of modern medicine. That a scientist has been charged with giving unconventional advice and can get up there and say, actually, it is not unconventional. It has been in the literature. The Association for Dietetics in South Africa is very, very much a gatekeeper of nutrition advice and the official dietary guidelines of South Africa. It's time to look at the results and the outcomes and say, maybe we got it wrong. And Professor Noakes is building a really powerful case for what really lies behind the epidemic of non-communicable diseases around the world. That's obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, even dementia that is now being called type 3 diabetes because of its links with diet. I'm talking about insulin resistance, which is so prevalent in this country. What actually lies at the heart of his case is the science, the wealth of evidence that supports low-carb, high-fat eating, and equally that high-carb, low-fat isn't so good for you after all. One of the definitive studies of the low-fat diet was done in the United States by the National Institute of Health to prove that the low-fat diet reduced the risk of cardiovascular disease, and they invested $700 million into it. There were 48,000 postmenopausal women who were going to be studied for eight years. They were divided into two groups, 40% were assigned to the low-fat eating pattern, and 60% could just eat what they liked. The low-fat group were told to reduce their energy from fat to 20% and from saturated fat to 7%, and increase the fruit and vegetable intake to at least five servings per day and grains to at least six servings per day. So that would be the dietary guidelines for Americans. And what did they find? After eight years, this amazing study, the low-fat diet did not significantly reduce the risk of coronary heart disease, stroke, or cardiovascular disease and achieved only modest effects on cardiovascular risk factors. So after all that effort, that was the outcome. In the 35 years we've been following the guidelines, animal fats are down by 17%, red meat down by 17%, eggs are down by 17%, whole milk down by 73%. So everything we've been told to cut down on, we have cut down. And everything we were told to increase, we increased. Grains are up by 41%. Vegetable oils up by 91% fruit up by 13%, vegetables up by 23%. So on the whole, Americans have been following the guidelines. It leads you inevitably to the conclusion there must be something wrong with the guidelines themselves. There were parts of the study which were a bit worrying. And this was women who were sick at the start of the trial with diabetes. This healthy diet should make them even healthier. But it didn't. Women with diabetes at worst. And what, what I found interesting is they've never reported the eight-year data on the women with diabetes in that study. And you have to ask, why? When these study results are coming out, they're deeply inconvenient. This hypothesis has been adopted not only by the American Heart Association, but also by the National Institutes of Health, the entire federal government, medical societies, and a number of industries, the vegetable oil industry, ADM, Monsanto, Bungie, some of the biggest companies in the world, and the grain industry and the soybean industry. So these results had to be ignored somehow or suppressed. I've been left with a very disturbing feeling that, that this hearing was set up from the very beginning. We'll adjourn tomorrow at 10 o'clock sharp. There is much more at stake than a simple tweet. There are powerful vested interests. People stand to lose a lot, whether it's status, money, in accepting Professor Noakes' viewpoint.
could you describe what the low carb, high fat pyramid would be? Yeah, actually, that's an important, that is maybe a graphic that more than any other. What you have to do is take the existing food pyramid and turn it upside down so that everything that used to be in the base of the food pyramid, grains, carbohydrates, really has to be up in the tip. And then below that are fruits and vegetables. And then, you know, in the big bottom slab really has to be fats and animal foods. That is actually what a healthy diet looks like. I was so excited to come here today to see if there's any changes with Abigail. The first time I met her, she was walking on top of the, the windowsills. She's a climber. <laughs> Abigail, get down. Flopping all around on the couches. <laughs> <laughs> she comes in and... Hey, cutie. She's absolutely calm. Say hi. Hi, Abigail. Do you remember me? It's very exciting. Very exciting. Can you say hi? Seems like she's losing some of that massive belly. It looked like she was like constantly bloated. Uh, that seems to have decreased. Her bowels have regulated. They don't. They were using a, a laxative every single day. And I don't know if you noticed that when when you're trying to present her something that she doesn't want. No. No. She's actually saying no. Yeah, I noticed that too. Actually, like, with her mouth, that. she's actually yeah. saying no. She's able to concentrate and she's able to um, progress because she's not running all over the place and she's not seizing. Her seizures are, are going down and we have the tangible data from the school. We are actually starting to wean her off of the anti-convulsory uh, narcotic that she's on that um, I think you guys heard plenty of complaints from me about. These are great strides within just five weeks. It's great. What do you make of his, uh, his sort of subdued attitude about all that? <laughs> They live with Abigail day in and day out. You don't see your children grow. That's incredible news. Yeah. Is that not big news? Or... Yeah. I have, I have faith in bigger, better things, man. All right, let me just get my recipe for this one now. So we're gonna make the chocolates and then... Yes, I want you to grind the macadamia nuts. Today we're gonna to be making two survival foods for somebody just starting out. The first one is macadamia bread. That's your fat bread that I That's saw? That's my fat bread. I'll deal with the messy part because I got the apron. <laughs> and I'd like to make a sugarless chocolate. It's something you can have in your refrigerator when you just, oh, I need something sweet. We both needed our little something. Yeah, I use Sivia. I don't use sugar because it elevates my blood sugar. Taste it, see what you think. I think it's perfect. I think it's perfect too. I think it's perfect. Everybody needs to learn a new word. It's called hyperinsulinemia. We're gonna grind the macadamia nuts into a butter. We are constantly triggering our insulin. Some people develop type 2 diabetes, some people develop cardiovascular disease, some people develop Alzheimer's. I develop cancer. In 2012, I went for a breast MRI. And something lit up like a Christmas light. I had invasive with HER2 amplification, which is very aggressive and metastatic type of breast cancer. I'm going to add the coconut butter. Cancer cells have an Achilles heel. You inhale oxygen, your bloodstream carries oxygen throughout your body, so that's an energy source for healthy cells. And that energy is used by the mitochondria, which is in the cytoplasm of the cell. But cancer cells can't do that. Don't do this if you have granite. They can't get energy from oxygen. Cancer cells need to ferment. They need sugar and refined carbohydrate to proliferate. Do you ever see Star Trek, The Trouble with Tribbles? Okay. Do you remember at the end they say, I figured it out. If you don't want them to reproduce, stop feeding them. And that's what cancer is. So I started a ketogenic diet. A ketogenic diet is a high fat, very low carb. It's like Atkins on steroids. 
This particular diet for cancer means 80% healthy fats, 10, 12, maybe 14% protein, and no more than 12 grams carbohydrates. Oh yeah, look at how nicely it rose. All I was looking for was to prevent it from metastasizing. And surprise of surprise, it started shrinking. My tumor started shrinking. You can see it came out gorgeous. And my last MRI, the radiologist said, had I not known you were diagnosed and treated, I would look at this from another patient and say, nothing to see here. So you never actually went through chemotherapy? I didn't do surgery, I didn't do chemotherapy, and I didn't do radiation, no. The headscarf is a religious... Right, yes, a absolutely. No, I no, worry. I have my I don't hair. I how to ask that. I have my hair. I eat well, I have a wonderful family, I have a wonderful healthy life. This can be in a donut pan so you can make lox cream cheese and bagels. I've never had an illness from the day I was diagnosed. My immune system is so good now that everybody will get sick with the flu and my grandchildren are coughing in my face and sticking their hands in my mouth and I don't get sick. That's the norm. Yes, that is the norm. I walk into the doctor's office and they say, oh, our miracle patient has arrived. And that was very disturbing to me because I didn't think, you know, God runs the world, of course, but I didn't think there was anything miraculous about what was happening. I thought it was hard science. What did I do that was different from what anybody else can do? And the answer to that was the research. A scientific study changes the picture. Cancer is described as an immensely heterogeneous disease. That's in fact a buzzword that's now uh, very much in the literature. If you have a primary tumor, this cell can have this mutation, and right next to it you can have a cell that has different mutations, and the cells in the metastases have still different ones. And so what happens is if you, no matter how you target your cancer therapies, you're going to end up catching some of the mutations, and then some of them are simply going to be mutations you didn't hit with these particular therapies, and then those cells are going to be the ones that survive and come back to get you. Most cancers are treated by cocktails of multiple drugs which fail. They also subject the patient to toxic side effects and poor quality of life while it's failing. But in some respects, the more heterogeneous the cancer gets, the more it tends to converge to a common metabolism. That cancer cells depend on glucose as a source of fuel. That then could lend itself to a metabolic approach which targets just that. I don't know that that's going to be the case in, in most cancers, but it still doesn't stop me from being optimistic about the idea of using diet as an adjunct to chemotherapies and other forms of therapies to improve the overall efficacy of treatment. So I can make anybody fat. Insulin causes weight gain. So for example, if I prescribe insulin to people, people gain weight. I could make you obese. I just have to give you enough insulin. If you think about what the major causes of disease are in the 19th century and early 20th century, what was killing people was infections, right? So people are dying of tuberculosis, people are dying of pneumonia. We develop penicillin, we develop all these great drugs. So people live. The problem is that's not our situation now. So we've taken the same attitude of here's a magic pill and we've applied it to a dietary disease. That's insane. The multi-million dollar question is why is it happening? I mean, it's not like we're deficient in pharmaceuticals, right? And we don't have a 2 jo deficit. Right now, it's really the perfect storm. I mean, we're eating more processed food than ever before. Our environment is toxic, and we're leading these incredibly stressful lives. I think a lot of diseases are really the same disease. So like obesity, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, it's all basically the same problem. Type 2 diabetes is a dietary disease. It's the leading cause of blindness. It's the leading cause of amputations. It's the leading cause of kidney disease and dialysis. It's a leading contributor to cancer. It's a leading contributor to heart disease. So practically 70% of what we practice in modern Western medicine is all related back to your diet. What happens when you're eating these high-carb diets is, of course, is this constant flood of first sugar and then insulin because your body's like freaking out, oh, it's too high, we're gonna hit a coma point here, <laughs> you gotta do something about this. So out comes the insulin. When you're constantly shouting with this insulin hormone, the receptors on the cell will down-regulate, it's called insulin resistance. The body is not responding well to insulin. 
It's like if you're shouting really loudly, people are gonna put their fingers into their ears, right? If you shout really loudly every day for years, the cells get deaf, they don't hear it anymore. The body has to excrete two times more, five times more, 10 times more than normal to get the message across. And then you treat it by injecting even more insulin. And I think that's, you know, criminally insane. When you start on the Lantus, which is the long-acting insulin, you start at it a certain number and then you gradually increase it by like three to five units a night based on what your sugars are. So I think I started out at 20. This is four years ago. And I was up to 55 in no time. When you look at diabetes type two, it affects every single system in your body. So it's not just the insulin and the, sh the sugars. You end up getting, I have peripheral neuropathy where I've lost feeling in my feet. I have gastroparesis. I have early kidney disease. I have, um, what else? I have coronary artery disease. The arteries in my whole body are pretty much affected. This carotid artery is 99% occluded meaning that I could have a stroke at any time. We had talked on Friday. Yes. And so you decreased your insulin even more. Did you have any issues this weekend? Where were no. your sugar levels? No, what? they were um, They were all good. Last night's was 91. Since the two months that I've been doing this food program, two? Yeah. It may just be six weeks that yeah, she's been weeks. here. Yeah. I've lost 17 pounds. And within a month we were able to decrease her insulin by half, even more. Oh. I don't have any more sliding scale, regular, short acting. I have the long term is down from 50 units to 20 units a night, which in the long run is going to save me a whole bunch of change. If things keep going the way they are, possibility is that she could cure her diabetes with food. Can you imagine? I was hopeless. I was just getting fatter and fatter and sicker and sicker and I really was at the end of my story. If I could inspire one, per one person to stop and take a look at what's happening with their life, if it's in regards to your weight, depression, diabetes, understand that there's hope. When they rounded up the tribes in this country and put them on reservations, they were starving and the U.S. government gave them commodity foods it consisted of white flour, sugar, and lard. What do you do with white flour, sugar, and lard? Is you make fry bread. It's our concentration camp food. The fate accompli of what we call manifest destiny, what happened to all of the aboriginal peoples of the earth since European encroachment, wasn't accomplished with guns, it was accomplished with food. Dampa has become number one food for your old people. <laughs> Settlers, missionaries, they gave us damper and our grandfathers, grandmothers and all our families, they liked it. That is looking yummy. These modern displacing foods were being brought in as rations by the missionaries. They're very addictive things like tobacco and sugar and flour. You must have a damper with a strip or rice jam. It's required. It must be. <laughs> but even if you took the syrup and the jam and all that stuff off of the damper, it would still be... It would still be bad. You under, it's still yaka. Yeah. Yaka menmak. Yaka menmak. Yaka menmak. Maize has become our staple food. It's called pup. 
in South Africa. It's mostly prevalent in impoverished rural communities. In South Africa, that's mostly our black population. So when we talk about maize being the staple food in Southern Africa, we have to understand how it got there. It was a decision by the South African government to produce maize on an industrial scale. And the question is, well, was that good for our people or not? It's not indigenous. It was never indigenous to South Africa. All our maize is genetically modified. It's refined. It's, it's high carb. You might as well be eating a bowl full of sugar. And dietitians, including the one who laid the complaint in the first place, are proponents. And I'll argue that it was the introduction of maize and making this a staple food which has been a problem for us. Meritage objection. I really can't see how the details about something based on a conspiracy theory is relevant. Madam Chair, in respect of the influence of industry driving the obesity epidemic, there were sponsors for Adsan. There were a number of sponsors, including Kellogg's, Pillsbury, etc. If you work with a flawed model of just energy in and energy out, you forget about how behaviors are modified. You forget about how addiction comes about. You forget about how advertising uh, influences the whole epidemic. I am submitting that that is irrelevant. The objection is overruled. Professor Noxi may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. What I learned during the process is the key to this debate, that industry completely controlled what the information coming out to the public was. And I expose that in one chapter. These guys know what they're doing. You know, it's not an accident, I don't believe, that people are hooked on all this junk and processed garbage. The Global Energy Balance Network was a front for Coca-Cola. There's something bigger going on here. The whole food system needs changing. What Coca-Cola is doing is to control the messaging of obesity globally by controlling the scientists. One of the tactics that industry uses is they'll fund studies that are designed to confuse the record. Their goal was not to talk about obesity, their goal was to confuse the public. Almost all scientific conferences depend on industry funding, even to discuss a subject. There's no funding, nobody's interested. Nobody wants to even talk about it. It's like depriving a field of oxygen. I've repeatedly been told that there's no evidence to support a low-carbohydrate diet. That's incorrect. This is a randomized controlled trial published in 2008 by Dr. Finney. These are expensive trials and there's no money to do it. He does not get funding from the National Institute of Health. He has to go and raise his money himself. This is the evidence. He's putting people with a metabolic syndrome, half of them on a high carbohydrate, low fat diet, and the other group on a high fat ketogenic diet. Look at the results. Body mass and abdominal fat, high fat outperforms high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Triglycerides are one of the key markers of metabolic syndrome, down 50% on the high fat diet. We tend to overconsume carbohydrate in this country because it's addicting, but also because we produce it in ridiculous amounts. If you fly from New York to LA, the majority of what you're flying over, all those little circles and squares on the ground, that's America pumping out carbohydrate as fast as it can. That's the 30,000 foot view, that's what's happening, and that's reflected in our grocery stores. Now here's the HDLC, which we all told is the good cholesterol. What we're not told is when you eat a high carbohydrate diet, your good cholesterol comes down. And you go on a high fat diet, HDL cholesterol goes up. There isn't a single multinational corporation on planet Earth that wouldn't stand to profit from every man, woman, and child consuming a carbohydrate-based diet. The very particles that are damaging our arteries are increased on a high-carbohydrate diet and reduced on a high-fat diet. It's incredibly cheap to produce, it's highly profitable, and it keeps you perpetually hungry. What could be more perfect? No, this is even more remarkable. Saturated fatty acids in the bloodstream, which greater your risk of heart attack. Now you eat more saturated fat, and the saturated fatty acids in the bloodstream go down. Pharmaceutical companies are profiting from this. Weight loss industry is profiting from this. Undertakers are making out like bandits. About the only people that aren't profiting from, from all of this are, are the rest of us. All right, this is what it looks like when a yuppie tries to approach a couple of cows on a farm. The biggest drawback was the budget because it's very expensive to eat healthy. One of the ideas we threw against the wall and it actually stuck was that we were gonna buy a grass-fed cow, a whole cow. Emma, why don't you go with my mom to pet the cows? We saved over $400. For tens of millions of years, long before we ever came along, grasslands and ruminants co-evolved. 
Cattle are basically designed to eat one thing and one thing only. Fresh green grass. Check it out. Yeah, buddy. Grass fed me. I've got hamburger. I've got T-bone steaks, porterhouse steaks. I've got liver. I didn't like it as a kid, but I thought came with the cow, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what we can do with it. The butcher, he's like, oh, you got bones for your dog, huh? <laughs> We're like, no, they're for us. Like, we used to have 40 more species of large herbivores roaming across North America before the end of the last ice age. And we had 60 million bison thundering across the Great Plains. Today we have 60 million cattle that are populating feedlots. You know, grain feeding of animals. And what do grains do to cattle? They fatten them up. We could take a hint from that. Roughly 97% of all the meat produced today is produced in these feedlots. For the animals! Go vegan! Vegan. And where we hear passionate vegetarians and vegans and animal rights advocates screaming about how we raise animals for food, I'm standing right there with them. This, it's wrong, it's unsustainable, and it has to stop. But there's also misinformation and misunderstanding being promoted by genuinely well-meaning people. What people don't understand is that everything really hinges on restoring natural systems. Do you see that happening in the United States? Like, can we reclaim our Midwestern prairies again? Is that possible? It depends on how successful this documentary is, <laughs> right? You were, you, used, you were a vegetarian. Oh, no, I was a vegan. I was never a vegetarian. I went from standard American diet, vegan. I think when I started as a teenager, um, I had very good impulses about the world that I wanted and the ethical base that I wanted to form, the actions of my, that were my life, that were going to be my life. That hasn't changed. So justice and compassion and anything that questions human hubris or human entitlement, those are the only values that are going to get us to the world that we need. The problem is information. And with a different collection of facts, a different set of information, I might have made a very different decision. If you want to reduce your carbon footprint, one of the best things you can do is eat locally, grow your own food in your own backyard. So I took this up with a fervor. I really wanted to, to do all this. So made a garden happen and pretty immediately hit the wall of what do plants eat? We're used to thinking of plants as sort of insensate salads. They actually have needs. Well, I'm going to get the organic whatever, and I go to the farm store and I'm looking around, and every single thing that's an amendment that is for fruit, like strawberries, um, it's bone meal and blood meal. Well, where do I think minerals come from? Well, I don't know. I've never done this before, and I'm horrified. I mean, I don't even want to smell it. I don't want to touch it. It feels so unclean. And where does this bone meal and blood meal come from? What, well, it what? comes from, you know, from animals. <laughs> it's like, where does this fall out of the sky? You know, like, I know this is about dead animals. It's horrifying to me. What do I do? I have to supply what the soil needs, and what the soil wants is dead plants and dead animals. And I can't take animals out of that equation. I mean, it's absolute hubris to think we can. That's what soil is. That's how it evolved. That's a thriving, living community. There are insects, and they want to eat strawberries, too. So either I'm going to kill them, or I'm going to get some creatures that will do it for me. And I went ahead and got chickens and ducks. Again, this was this just tremendous moment of ethical and moral meltdown. So now I'm enslaving these chickens and ducks to do this terrible thing for me, which is kill. You've never seen anything like a duck eat a slug. You want to see happiness? This is what I live for, was what my duck said. And boy, was she a happy little creature, the chickens as well. So they ate all the bugs for me, and I never saw another slug. Animals tell us what they want. You know, if you just let them do what their nature is to do, then they're it's not even that they're happy, it's that they are who they should be. The most destructive thing we've done is this activity called agriculture. We don't really have a clue what goes into making that corn or making that soy. Um, it, all we know is that you, know, you look down on your plate and it, it doesn't look like a dead thing. Therefore, <laughs> it somehow must be peaceful and kind and sustainable. And we're utterly wrong about this. You have to understand what agriculture is. 
you take a piece of land and you clear every living thing off it. And I'm including the bacteria in that. So all the plants and animals that are supposed to live there, they're gone. Now you're gonna grow an acre of corn or wheat. Um, that corn is gonna require things um, that are not there for it, and you're gonna have to come from the outside and apply them. It's gonna take a lot of fertilizer, insecticides and fungicides, because you're fighting a war, right? All those other plants and all those other little animals wanna come back. Now another thing that happens is every time you plant that corn, you're destroying that soil, a prairie or a grassland. It's the perennial roots that make channels for the rain. When you only have annuals, they don't live a long time, so they don't have time to build long roots. So year by year, you are drawing down that soil. And then, of course, all that soil washes off. You know, if you're on any kind of a slope, it all is just going to go into the local river and kill it with all that dirt. So now there's no fish either. In the meantime, though, while the corn is still growing, you can transport it to a miserable cow living on a cement floor inside a steel building and feed that cow for about 60 days. Past that point, she will die from the corn because it's not her natural diet. Um, but until that point, she will get really fat really fast and then slaughter her, feed her to humans. So you're gonna make people sick eating this meat as well. As far as I can tell, this is nothing but death and destruction from the very beginning to the very end of this. Now I'm going to walk you through another scenario, which is you take the same acre of land, but you don't hurt it in any way. You let it have its own wisdom, its own impulse toward life, its own wild way. And what you have is a whole bunch of perennial plants growing there. You have a whole bunch of really sturdy grasses. You've got big birds and you've got ground-dwelling birds and then you've got Small mammals and larger mammals, you might even have every once in a while a really big mammal come across there. You know, you might have a wolf or a bear or somebody. And in the meantime, you've got a ruminant. So you've produced the same amount of food for people. You've got the one ruminant at the end. You know, you slaughter her and, and now people can eat. But that acre that is still in that prairie, that grassland, you could come back in 10,000 years and all of that life would still be there. The only thing different would be a little more soil, which is to say a little more resilience, a little more depth to life. Um, and that is how we lived for two and a half million years as humans on this planet, participating in that cycle. We're here in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia and what we do is pastured livestock. In nature, herbivores live in large groups and they migrate. All we're doing is duplicating that kind of migration. It's moving the animals across the land so that this choreography, this ballet of the pasture can perform its dance on the grass. When people say eating this way is unsustainable. Oh, listen, it's not only sustainable, it's actually what we call regenerative. It allows the grass then time to regrow, to recuperate. Grass is essentially 95% sunshine. This takes sunbeams and converts it to something that has weight. And amazingly, the herbivore can take this, ferment it in her rumen, and turn this into arguably the most nutrient-dense food in the world. Grass grows in, in what I call, you know, an S curve. You can see that S. So diaper down here, teenage, rapid growth, and then nursing home out here. What we want to do is keep this forage in this rapid growth state as, as much as possible. So the role of the herbivore in nature is actually to prune the grass to restart that rapid uh, metabolic capacity. This is what builds soil hydrates the landscape and actually sequesters carbon. This, this is the system. When grass is allowed to be as productive as it's supposed to be, it actually is far more efficient at converting solar energy into biomass than even trees. That's why all the rich, deep soils of the planet are under prairies with herbivores. And if every farm in the world would do this, we would sequester all the carbon that's been emitted since the beginning of the industrial age in fewer than 10 years. When a confinement animal facility shows a picture of this hog factory or chicken factory or whatever, 
they're not showing all the land that's required to grow the grain to keep it going and all the land that's required to handle all the manure that it's generating. In this system, you're seeing all that land. I think a lot of industrial agriculture thinking is that, that the earth is a, is a reluctant lover. Whereas actually, we view the earth as an abundant loving partner who responds to caress, who responds to care. And if we will come humbly to the land, why, it's ready to give us way more than we could have wrestled from it. This is the, the mystical, awesome cycle of life. And to be able to be this close to it has a humility to it, a perspective that is actually quite profound and, and actually quite historically normal. Really for the past few years, every time I've spent time with my mom, um, just like her cognition reminded me of my grandmom. Like it was starting to remind me of like those early stages of my grandmom. My son just told me not too long ago, he said, I love you and I'm really becoming concerned with you. You're starting to check out of, of life. <laughs> I see you starting to deteriorate the same way that she did. That scares me. I used to get these horrible headaches. I, I was battling depression. I would just start to cry. I would tell my husband, I said, I, I'm tired of this. I'm just tired of feeling like this. Since we started eating clean like this, I have not had, and I kid you not, I have not had one of those headaches, not one. My energy level, my, my thought processing, I mean, I've seen remarkable changes. You know, until you've been there in that dark place, you can't really grasp the magnitude of it. I have been there and I have lived that. It's like a vicious cycle, you know? And this is, this is just so much better. Does it taste like a strawberry? Was it good? Yeah? To sit down and have a conversation with my mom, and she's, she's clear-headed, like, for the first time in years. She got to squirt water down into the hole. I feel like I've got my mom back. I can't wait to see in six months from now what other changes could there possibly be. The good news is something I never thought I would hear myself say, that I am completely off all insulin. Oh, Patty, yeah. congratulations. Thank That's you. incredible. Yeah. yeah. When your blood sugars have been completely fine? It's been 10 days. <laughs> Are you kidding? But who's counting? How I'm much weight have you lost in entire? 45 pounds so far. It's so exciting. 45. I think that's three dress size. I'm halfway. I, want, I would like to lose 90, so. I find that so fascinating. The first lines of defense are always like, take this pill, take that pill, that medication. And like, oh, you're at the end of your rope. And say, so maybe you should try changing what you eat. I think I always knew that but I don't think I knew how. And as much medical knowledge as I have, even nursing, I don't think they teach you enough about nutrition. I mean, that kind of makes me a little bit embarrassed to say, but it's, it's been a whole big lot of reflection. A whole new world opened up. I think that's what was amazing to me. I mean, I just... Yeah. Anyway, I, I can't I'm happy. Enough, so thank you for that. Thank you. There's something implicit in all of this that no one seems to be saying. The human body is a vastly complex system, but how we fuel it is really simple. If we fuel our bodies correctly, then the complexity should just take care of itself. So, metabolically speaking, there are really only two fuels we can use. They are sugars and carbohydrates, which is glucose, and fat, which is ketone bodies. If we go with the notion that fat is the fuel that nature has intended, then suddenly all the dominoes just fall into place. The final part of the jigsaw, 
We spend millions of rands training hypertension experts, obesity experts, diabetes experts, heart disease experts, but they're all treating the same condition. We can continue to teach a failed model. We can continue to train more doctors and build more hospitals and tell people they must eat lots of carbohydrates. A model that is causing millions of South Africans every few years to develop type 2 diabetes. Or we can say maybe we got it wrong. Because the only people who are suffering besides myself and my wife are the people of South Africa. Professor Noakes, on a charge of unprofessional conduct, the majority of this committee find you not guilty. You've got to let it go and watch it grow. Cause it takes every voice to make this world all. It's been about five months since I started eating this way. My clothes fit better, my skin is clearer, my voice is clearer, my mind is clearer. I was having ongoing respiratory infections most of my life. That has, I haven't had a single thing. No antibiotics whatsoever. No antibiotics. I haven't needed it. I haven't used my inhaler for about three months for any reason whatsoever. But I did not expect my lungs to clear out. No more inhaler. Our bodies are perfect. You, if you don't actually take a moment to just revere the way nature works, just truly look at it, at how perfect it is. You're in for trouble. Cause if you listen to the voice within, a melody will soon begin. And you'll feel the vibration in your soul. This is my blanket, my sheets that I born with. My mom used to always make me warm with this, like this. A week ago you were talking to me and you weren't, your body was not in a pleasant place for you. No, not yet. The second week I went out on that walk and I started singing away as I was walking. And I was so happy. My body was rejoicing. Rejoicing? Brilliant. And I felt this is the first time that I have ever felt flexibility, the refreshment inside. From this time on, I am going to look after my body. How's the asthma? No, it, it's been. I haven't been worrying about it anymore. It's, I think it's gone. Hmm. You look at the problem of Indigenous health and it just seems like this massive epidemic that's just so huge and impossible and how can you find a pathway through it and so many resources have been poured into it and I think so many Australians are frustrated about how many resources have been poured into it and we're not seeing any results and it feels like this hopeless solution and then it's crazy when you can get people in a situation where you can change what they're eating just for a few days and you can already see these incredible improvements in their well-being in their blood pressures in their blood sugar levels and you think how can it be this simple it can't be this simple. It can't be this simple, but it's happening. Look at it there, everywhere. Learning all of this, so nice. Human anatomy, all these blood cells, all these cells that make up a body, so perfectly woven together. So beautiful. You 
you touch your nose. Touch your nose. Boop. 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 She's pulling her hand. Boop. That's it. That's your nose. One more time. Ready? Boop. Abigail, where's my nose? <laughs> nose. It's almost like her brain has had this certain way of functioning. Like biologically, it's functioned as a brain of a person with autism. Until we started to give her the nutrients that her body and her brain needs to start functioning normally. Can I have the block? Can you give it to me? Good <laughs> job! Oh my gosh, I never thought I'd do that. Give the block to daddy. Daddy. Come on, you silly. Yes! Now, give the blocks to mommy. To mommy. mommy. Give the blocks to mommy. Good job. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but at this point, she's like six years behind, so she's starting at the level of a two-year-old, or whatever developmental level that Abigail's at. I got her a bunch of summer clothes in April because it was her birthday. It was probably not until July I started to put them on her. They were all too big. They were all like a size too big for her. She looks amazing. <laughs> it's such an easy recipe. I've got it memorized. It's four eggs, half a cup of almond butter, and a cup of squash. So no grains? No grains. And I'm, I always melt some ghee over top of the pancakes so she gets some fat. There's a child trapped in this body that, that is, you know, crying out to be released, you know? Hey! hey. And it's like she's waking up. I know a carpenter, I know a laborer, he is my teacher, he is my brother, I have a neighbor, he is my savior, he doesn't waver, he's a strong believer, I know a farmer, I know his vision, I know his struggle, I know his hope, they are all archetypes. People that I might like to be just like in a completely different way. And we all we're coming out of our caves, coming out of our caves. Yes, we all oh. catch a swell, catch a wave.